All right, good evening. We are on lesson 11, talking about the uses of the law. Following along in your workbook, this is page 73. The uses of the law, considering catechism questions 12 through 19 and 97 through 110. We begin at the top of the page with the blue box where it says the conclusion of the Ten Commandments. He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who transgress his commandments. Therefore, we should fear his anger and not disobey what he commands. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should love and trust in him and gladly obey what he commands. All right, so today, tonight, we're talking about the uses of the law. Um, and we're going to be starting in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. A little bit shorter section in comparison to some of the other readings that we've had, but there's a lot here, and it's very instructive as an illustration for what we're going to be talking about. A couple of summary points there um, in your workbook before we begin our reading. First summary point, David had sinned by committing adultery, which is a sin against the sixth commandment, um, com by committing adultery with Bathsheba. We also hear about that from 2 Samuel 11. And then he murdered her husband Uriah by ordering that the rest of the soldiers in the army offer him no help when the enemy attacked him. That was a sin against the fifth commandment. Um, secondly, David had largely tried to ignore his sins for the better part of a year. It's, you know, like nine months, almost ten months before we hear David actually being confronted with his sin. And then finally, in a beautiful example of the use of the keys, Nathan confronted David about his sin with the goal of leading him to repentance. And for that discussion on the use of the keys, what are they? The loosing key and the locking key, or unlocking and locking, loosing and binding, um, basically law and gospel. For a discussion on that, go back to episode 10, talking about um, the use of the keys and the public ministry. That's available in YouTube as well as at the RWJ membership podcast. So tonight, 2 Samuel 12, verses 1 through 13, um, here on your screen. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and one poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did such a thing and had no pity. Continuing in verse 7. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you, and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me, and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite, to be your own. This is what the Lord says, Out of your own household I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. And so context, um, the, the setting, which is chapter 11, and that'll probably be part of your homework tonight, um, to read through Second Samuel chapter 11. And it get, kind of gives the whole background, and the, the author of the book of Second Samuel is 
very understated in his indictment of, of King David, but he's also very pointed, where it begins in the spring at the time when kings go off to war. David is at home. David isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing, and he gets up, he leaves his wife in bed, and, um, and he gets up and he's wandering around the roof of the palace because he can't sleep, and he sees this other woman bathing. Um, and, and so he calls her over, and, and he has sex with her, and, um, and she turns out to be pregnant. And when, when he hears that she's pregnant, he calls her husband back from the front line of battle and tries to get her husband to go home to his wife so that, you know, so that the man would assume that the baby was his. Rather, and when Uriah doesn't do that, three different ways David tried to get him to go home. Um, he even got Uriah drunk in an attempt to say, well, go home to your wife. And um, when Uriah doesn't do that, David sends Uriah back to the front lines with orders in an envelope. And Uriah hands the orders to the general. And the orders are, put Uriah at the place where the fighting is fiercest and then withdraw from him so that he falls down and dies. Um, and in that way, David covered his, his tracks, or so he thought, because then Uriah died and David took Bathsheba into his own house as his own wife. Um, you know, the grieving widow scenario. And then a few months later, this baby is going to be born. And it's during those last few months, you know, the third trimester of, of the pregnancy that the prophet Nathan comes to David. Because where chapter 11 ended was the thing that Nathan, or the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Okay, so that'll be, that's the overview and synopsis. And I think, you know, chapters 11 and 12 put together, um, it's one of the more notable events of Old Testament Bible history. And it's definitely, definitely worthwhile as part of your homework a little bit later tonight. Anyway, um, continuing on, number one on your sheet or in your workbook. Um, David was Nathan's good friend. Da Nathan was his, you know, personal pastor. David was also the king of Israel. How do you think Nathan was feeling when God sent him to confront David with his sin? And this is, you know, the David of David and Goliath. And David and Goliath was like 30 or 40 years previously. And since then, David has been a very strong general. He has, um, he has killed hundreds or thousands of men in battle um, as, he, as he's the warrior who led and brought peace to the nation of Israel. He drove out all their enemies and secured the nation. And now Nathan has to go and confront him. How do you think he's feeling? Well, <laughs> a little bit nervous, I would say. Um, definitely nervous. And maybe you know, he's got to take a deep breath and say, well, how am I going to bring this up to him? Say, David, you know, there's a baby coming soon and the math doesn't add up. But he begins with this story that we'll see in just a minute. Uh, number two, what had David's job been? before he became a king. I think that's in our supplemental passages here from 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, maybe not. Oh, here's the, the background. We'll get to that in a little bit later here. Oh, actually, this is right now. Um, 2 Samuel 11. We had kind of talked about this um, previously, that David got up from his couch. He was walking around on the roof, and, um, and he had seen Uriah's wife as he's walking around, and she says, oh, I'm pregnant. And then in the morning, this is kind of what I had summarized previously. Um, Uriah was stationed where the strongest warriors were, and Uriah the Hittite also died. First uh, Samuel 16, 11 through 13, reads like this. Samuel said to Jesse, is that all of the young men? Jesse said, there is still the youngest, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send for him, for we cannot sit down and to eat until he comes. He sent for him and brought him in. David had red hair and striking eyes and was good looking. The Lord said, Get up, anoint him, because this is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. The Spirit of the Lord rushed on David with power from that day forward. After that, Samuel set out and returned to Ramah. So what had David been previous to being king? He had been a shepherd. 
Um, even from, from a young boy, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, he's out tending the sheep by himself. He has a sling, he has a staff, he has a, he has a big stick, you know, like a rod is what they, they call it. The staff has that little crook or the hook on the end. Um, and he could use that to, you know, scare off animals or, you know, kill small animals, um, with the, the, the sling as well. Number three, why would the story that Nathan had been told have been a particularly powerful one for David? Well, he would have felt strongly for the man and his sheep because he himself had been a shepherd. He had, um, he had cared for sheep for a long time and he knew what it was, what it was like to be familiar with these animals because the shepherd would, you know, sleep with the flock, you know, bring the flock into the sheep pen at night and sleep or sleep nearby if the sheep were out, out on the pasture. And, um, and then the different shepherds would take turns keeping watch over their flock at night. Um, so there's that close relationship where, and there's, there's not much, maybe not many people to talk to when you're out there being a shepherd, you just talk to the sheep and, and even though they're, not very smart <laughs> at the time at the same time they can be fairly affectionate and um and you know the same way that you know we might talk about a dog or a cat in the house um a dog or a cat might be a lot smarter than a sheep but there's still that that sense of companionship so david's like wow this is this is a really bad story nathan why are you telling me this number four in what ways was David's behavior like the rich man who stole the poor man's sheep? A number of different details that Nathan included there. Well, God had blessed David richly. He had he had been given um, multiple wives, and even though yeah, that will be another topic for when we discuss the sixth commandment specifically and the topic of marriage. But he took the wife of another man, and then killed that man. Wow. Pretty serious. Number five, what did God want David to understand when he sent Nathan to him? Well, that his sins were dangerous, that David in his unrepentance had really cut himself off from God's grace. And this was a serious thing, that even though David thought he had kept it hidden from everyone, God knew. And that is, that is not okay, <laughs> that God knew that it was not okay. Um, that's where chapter 11 had ended. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. But there's also forgiveness even for those sins. Number six, which one of the keys, either the locking key or the unlocking key, was Nathan able to use for David? I'm looking at verse 13, chapter 12, verse 13 in particular. Um... Wrong one, sorry. So chapter, uh, 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, right down here. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. Okay. So that is the unlocking key, the announcement of forgiveness. David repented. David had been brought to an understanding and a recognition of his sin, and Nathan assured him that his sin was forgiven. Number seven. What's the difference between the two main teachings of God's word? Talking about law and gospel. That law and gospel are found throughout scripture. These are the main doctrinal teachings. Um, and they have spiritual value, and they are spiritual tools that God uses to uh, bring us to a recognition of our sin and lead us to trust in Jesus as our Savior. So what's the difference? The law tells us what to do and what not to do, and that there is punishment for disobedience. The gospel tells us what Jesus did for us, and that we have been forgiven. Going on to the next page, page 74. So the law basically says do, the gospel says done, because Jesus did it. Uh, at the top of the page, read Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, to find Christ's simple summary of the law as found in God's word. Um, here we are. 
Starting right here. Jesus said to an expert in the law who questioned him about what was the greatest commandment. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All these, the law, all the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Okay, so the summary from Jesus, and that's our key term. Love God above all things and love your neighbor as yourself. And even there, we need to understand what is, how does the Bible define love? Um, you know, first John talks about it as this is love for God to obey what he commands, that it's not just some emotional flighty feeling. Um, and it's not, you know, the standard of God's law is not whatever you find in your heart. The standard for God's law is seen in his word. And so even the definition of love is to do what is best in the best interest of the other in line with the word of God. Um, and so doing what is in the best interest of God means, yes, obeying him and, uh, and giving him honor and thanks and praise. Doing what is in the best interest of others often means carrying out our daily vocation, such as a mother or father, employer, employee, all the different hats that we wear, carrying out those things as well as encouraging truth when it comes to what is the word of God. True doctrine is a loving act. Um, and even, even admonishing for sin is a loving act because it is doing what is in the best interest of another. Because the best, it's not in the best interest of somebody to walk away from the faith, deny the faith, or have their persistent unrepentant sin kill their faith with the result that they perish eternally. And that understanding of what is love needs to be something we have firmly embedded in our minds. That love means doing what is in the best interest of the other in line with the word of God. Um, yeah, we'll come around to that again. That's a, that's a major topic in uh, today and, and always. Another, uh, number eight, another more detailed summary of the law can be found in the Ten Commandments. Read Deuteronomy 5, verse 22. Where do we get the Ten Commandments? Maybe you saw the movie with uh, Charlton Heston. A movie of the same name. Deuteronomy 5, verse 22. These are the words, The Lord spoke to your whole assembly at the mountain, from the middle of the fire, the thick cloud and the gloom, with a loud voice, and he did not add anything. He wrote them down on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. So where do we, where were they first told the Ten Commandments? Where do we get the Ten Commandments? God gave them to Moses after he led his people out of slavery in Egypt. So that's a summary of God's moral law. And God's moral law applies to all people of all time because that is, that is what God expects of all people of all time. That is his moral law. So these Ten Commandments are a summary of God's will for all people of all time. But as we'll see a little bit later in one of our other lessons, that these commandments are sometimes phrased in terms that apply specifically to the nation of Israel. So how do we know, how do we know what applies to the Old Testament nation of Israel and what applies to us Christians today? And how do we know that it is God's moral law? Well, it's repeated in the New Testament. Um, and so, you know, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods, that is repeated in the New Testament. Uh, the second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Jesus says that too. Uh, the third commandment is probably the one that gives people the most trouble. Um, the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Jesus says, and Paul writes, that the Sabbath pointed ahead to Jesus. That the Sabbath was a day of rest from work and a day set aside specifically for worship. And... Um, in the Old Testament, Israelites got caught up in what, how do we define work and what's the loophole here rather than seeing the principle behind it. So we don't have to obey a Sabbath law as such, but we do recognize and the New Testament reiterates the principle behind it that we do set aside some time for rest from our work and for worship of the Lord and, um, and so on. And so whatever is in, you know, it's repeated in the New Testament. The, for instance, the dietary laws and the restrictions on types of, you know, clothing that you can wear. You couldn't wear clothing made from two types, you know, a linen polyester or linen cotton blend 
wasn't something that you could wear. You know, your shirt was all cotton or it was all linen, but it wasn't both. Um, or dietary restrictions on, you know, not eating pork, not eating, not eating shellfish, things like that. Um, the New Testament makes it abundantly clear that we are not bound by those restrictions. Okay, so when you talk about the summary of God's moral law, or God's law is found in the Ten Commandments. Um, and yes, the third commandment is repeated in the New Testament, at least the principle behind it. All that to say that the Ten Commandments <laughs> is the summary of the moral law that God gave to his Old Testament people. So using Jesus' basic summary of the law as a model, the Ten Commandments can be split into two parts. We call this division the, ten, the two tables of the law. Uh, you can review the list of the Ten Commandments on pages 1, 2, and 3 of Luther's Small Catechism. So our key term, the two tables of the law, um, Commandments 1, through three, 1, 2, and 3, talk about love God above all things. And then Commandments 4 through 10, talk about loving your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor, um, as the, Jesus makes clear, especially with the parable of the Good Samaritan, the neighbor isn't just the person who lives next to you or near you. And the neighbor is, um, it's really a question of how can I be a neighbor to somebody else. Next one, a lot of terms in this one. <laughs> trying, to, trying to get our feet on the ground about uh, what, do, what do all these things mean. The law has three basic uses, as a curb, a mirror, and a guide. Read Leviticus 26, verses 14 through 17 to help explain the law's use as a curb. If you will not listen to me and do not obey all these commandments, if you reject my regulations and you detest my ordinances so much that you do not obey all my commandments so that you will break my covenant, I, in turn, will do this to you. I will inflict upon you panic wasting disease and fever, which will cause your eyes to fail and your vitality to slip away. You will sow your seed, but get no return, for your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you. You will be beaten by your enemies, and those who hate you will rule over you. You will flee, even though nobody is pursuing you. All right, pretty strong. Um, when we talk about a curb, it's helpful to think of, you know, what is a curb as you're driving down the street? It helps to keep the cars from going off the road. And so the curb, when we talk about the curb uh, as a use of the law, it threatens punishment for people if they don't keep the law. It, um, it, it's that external restraint to help you from breaking that law. And that applies to all people. That all people recognize, or at least you know, use the law, recognize, I suppose is a good word, the law as a curb. Um, that's why, you know, one of my favorite examples, that's why you probably drive the speed limit instead of, you know, going 100 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour um, down, down the road. Because number one, there's the curb of the police officer who would give you a ticket. And number two, there's the curb of the natural consequences of losing control and, um, and hurting yourself or somebody else. Those are, you know, talking about the consequences of a sin as helping to prevent somebody from open sin. Okay. Uh, next one, a key term, mirror, from Romans 7, verse 7, and Romans 3, verse 20. That is here in our supplemental passages. What will we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. On the contrary, I would not have recognized sin except through the law. For example, I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. And Romans 3, verse 20, No one will be declared righteous in his sight by works of the law, for through the law we become aware of sin. So, you think about the use of a mirror. What does a mirror do? It shows you your face. Um, you can say, oh, I've got some broccoli stuck in my teeth, or I need, to, I need to comb my hair, or something like that. The mirror, talking about using the law as a mirror, it shows our sin. It shows that we need a savior. And again, the cur just as the curb applies to all people, the curb restrains outward sinful behavior, but not always and not fully. Um, the mirror applies to all people as well, that all people can see based on God's law that they are sinful and that they, that they need a savior. And then finally, this is the top of the next page, top of page 75, 
Read Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 to explain the law's use as a guide. I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your appropriate worship. Also, do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you can test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. So the last one um, is the law as a guide. I like to call this the guide for thankful Christian living because this only applies to Christians. This only applies to somebody who has been given the gift of faith through the means of grace, if you remember those terms. Um, somebody who has been brought into faith that God has come to them in his word and in his sacraments. He has created faith. And then the Christian looks at God's law with new eyes to say, wow, you mean I've been completely, totally, utterly forgiven forever? <laughs> How can I thank my God? How can I thank God for doing this for me? And the Christian doesn't have to look around and say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to go on a, on a journey. I'm going to go on a pilgrimage. All these, all these things that other religions demand. We look at God's law again, but with new eyes. That we you know, look to the law as a guide for thankful Christian living. The key term, the third use of the law, the law as guide. It shows Christians how to live lives to thank God. So if you want to thank God, well, love the Lord your God. Spend some time with worship. Um, how do you thank God? Obey your parents. Um, help and befriend your neighbor in every bodily need. Um, honor marriage and honor your spouse. Love, honor, and respect them. Um, you know, the seventh commandment, you shall not steal. How do you thank God? Well, you help your neighbor to preserve and protect his property and means of income. In the eighth commandment, how do you, how is the law as a guide for thankful Christian living in the eighth commandment? Talking about, um, Talking about lies and false testimony, well, you speak up. You don't tell lies about people, you don't gossip, and you speak up in defense of people when they are being lied about or gossiped about. We've been told the truth in a way that isn't loving. Um, ninth and Tenth Commandment really deal with the topic of coveting, wanting something that belongs to somebody else. So how do you thank God? Well, be content with what he has given to you. So that law as a guide uh, shows Christians how to live lives to thank God which is kind of the summary diagrams on page 75. That the purposes of the law and, and the same statement of law can be used for all three purposes. Um, there aren't laws that are, there aren't passages that are specifically, oh, this is curbed, that is, and that is mirror. This is the effect of the law in the Christian heart as a curb or in, in anybody's heart, as a curb and a mirror. And the effect of the law in the Christian heart also has the effect of the law as a guide for thankful Christian living. And God's law tells us what is right and wrong. God tells us what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and, and it's written. It's written in our hearts. That's what we call the conscience. But that conscience is clouded by sin, and it will mislead us. It, it might tell us something is right when it's actually not right according to the Word of God. Or in other cases, especially for you know, people who may have come from a difficult home circumstance or had a bad experience re with religion previously, um, that conscience may be informed in such a way that it says something is wrong when it's actually not wrong according to the Word of God. And so the conscience can be mistaken, um, but God's Word in the Bible is always clear. And that Word in the Bible is summarized in the Ten Commandments. Basically, love God and love your neighbor. And those Ten Commandments are where you know, pastorally and as a father, this is where we like to, I like to start with teaching our children. Even a child as young as two, two and a half, um, can begin repeating after mom or dad. You know, usually we just do this in, at nighttime right before bed and uh, stick with one commandment for a week, usually. And especially it works if you make it a game with the kids. Um, like the first commandment is very easy. You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Maybe the first evening, repeat after me, you shall have, you shall have, no other gods, no other gods. And that's all you do. Maybe you do that two times, maybe three times. Uh, maybe the next night or two nights later, you add the what does this mean? And then over the course of the week, you get the whole thing. <laughs> and, uh, and we also repeat these in worship fairly regularly so that over the course of a calendar year, we go through the entire summary catechism 
in um, about two times, maybe maybe three times. And and I think this is this is very beneficial for especially for parents, but for all of us to really look through those. And what you'll see, um, a little bit, and I'll wrap up on this in just a minute. What you see if you look in your catechism at the at the Ten Commandments and the explanation, the part that says what does this mean, that the commandments always almost always begin with with we should fear and love God. So that puts it in the context of a Christian, a Christian context, that this is a guide for thankful Christian living. We should fear and love God, and then so that we don't do this thing, but we do do this thing. We should fear and love God that we do not um, use his name to curse, swear, lie, or deceive, or use it superstitiously, but we should call upon God's name in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. Uh, what's another one? The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and defend him in every bodily need. And that format is fairly simple to remember uh, once you see it, once you understand it. And, um, you know, I think the sixth commandment is the only one that doesn't include what we should not do because that one is fairly easy for even children or older children to understand the sixth commandment talking about the godly use of the body and God's gift of marriage. You shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? We, we should fear and love God that we lead a pure and decent life in words and actions and that husband and wife love and honor each other. Okay. So there we go. And that is in the front part of your catechism. Be sure to check that out. That'll be another part of your homework today. Number nine which use or uses of the law did Nathan use when he came to confront David with his sin? Well, that was pretty much all law as mirror. This is what you have done, David. Number 10. We sin by doing what God has told us not to do and by not doing what God has told us to do. This is the difference between a sin, a sin of commission and a sin of omission. Sin of com commission, you see the word commit. Sin of omission, you see the word omit. So a sin of commission is doing the wrong things that God says we shouldn't do. And then a sin of co omission, sin of omission, the things we omit, is not doing the good things that God says we should do, or leaving undone the good things that God says we should do. Number 10. Mark the following sins that David committed as either a sin of commission or a sin of omission. Well, he didn't turn away and leave when he saw Bathsheba bathing. Omission. He lusted after Bathsheba. He committed that sin of lust within his heart. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, sin of commission. He didn't confess his sin, sin of omission. He lied to Uriah, commission, and had Uriah killed, sin of commission. All right, so sin of omission, you omit the good things that you should do. Number 11, God's law is part of the natural knowledge of God. Our consciences know basic right and wrong without having to be told. Why did God also write the law in his word? That is the revealed knowledge of God from that previous lesson. Well, to reinforce what we know and to correct where our consciences might be wrong. Um, there are different cultures and times when things might be culturally accepted when they are still against the word of God. And so we don't go by what we feel in our hearts and by what culture says, but we go by what God says in his word. And that word informs our consciences. Number 12, read Leviticus 19 verse 2 and Matthew 5 verse 48. That's in our supplemental passages here. First one, Leviticus 19, verse 2. The Lord told Moses to speak to the whole community of the Israelites and to tell them these things. You shall be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then that's actually repeated in the New Testament. Scrolling up, here we are. In Matthew 5, verse 48. Jesus said, said So then, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So how well does God expect us to keep the law? 
perfectly. <laughs> Easy peasy, right? And that's the, the image at the top of page 77, the green diagram there. That God is a jealous God. When he calls himself a jealous God, that word jealous just means wanting what belongs to him. Um, and God is a jealous God. He wants the honor that belongs to him. He wants the obedience that belongs to him. That is his right to demand as God. And, um, and when we talk about God's law, that, yes, God has threats that are attached to his law. Uh, anger, um, trouble in this world, and eventually death and hell. And for that reason, we will fear God and not disobey what he commands. But God promises grace and every blessing to all who obey his commandments. And for this reason, we love and trust and gladly obey what he commands. And, and that's that external encouragement that we want with all of our heart, soul, and mind to obey every one of God's commands. So far, so good. Any questions, be sure to contact me, Pastor Hagen, uh, P-A-S-T-O-R-H-A-G-E-N at iCloud.com. 419-262-8280. Wrapping it up, number 13. As we study the Ten Commandments in more detail, lessons 12 through 17, we'll see over and over again that we haven't kept God's law perfectly. What should we keep in mind about Jesus' act of obedience and his passive obedience? You can turn back to lesson 4 for that. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit pause. Um, if you're following along in the podcast, flip back to lesson four. Our encouragement that, yes, Jesus kept God's law perfectly in our place, that he actively obeyed all that God commanded, and he allowed himself to be killed, or he allowed himself to be crucified in order to take away our sin. So he has given us his holiness, his holy perfect record, as well as taken the punishment for our sin so that you and I are completely free from our sin and from the threat of punishment, as well as we have the positive addition of the holiness of Jesus applied to you and me personally through holy baptism and through his word. So wrapping it up, our connection question today. Sometimes when the pastor speaks God's law in his sermons, it makes us feel uncomfortable. Why can we be thankful that our pastor has the courage to speak in this way? And, and I'll readily admit that you're not the only one who's uncomfortable when we have a strong statement of God's law. Um, that's, that's one of the challenges of the pastoral ministry is to not, not water it down, but rather to say it as strongly as God says it with all the severity that God has attached to it. Well, we are thankful that God is speaking through the pastor to show us our sin so that we don't harden our hearts and become unrepentant, but rather turn to Jesus for forgiveness. So wrapping up for our homework tonight. Read 1 Samuel 11 and 12. If you have any questions, contact me. Pastor Hagen at iCloud.com. That's my old phone number. Uh, 419 8280. That is my number. <laughs> um, read 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And check out um, the homework at the bottom of the page as well. Um, review pages 33 through 38 and 109 to 116 in your catechism. Review those terms that we learned tonight and those other pages in your catechism as well. So a little bit of reading, and if you want a review of this, um, check out the RWJ Membership Podcast, uh, where all the recordings from this membership class are hosted, as well as the RWJ Daily, the Raised with Jesus Podcast, um, 10 Minutes Every Day Where the Life of Jesus Meets Yours. That 10 minutes is an average. You know, two days ago, I think yesterday's Bible reading was 7 or 8 minutes long, and today's was 16, so it's, I try to keep it between 10 and 12 minutes each day. Um, if you have any other questions or comments, be sure to contact me. Thanks so much for joining us. God bless your day.